So hello, welcome. Um, my name is Christophe de Dinochin. I'm working from Red Hat, and I'm introducing myself because none of these guys can say my name right. So, <laughs> so I'm working on virtualization. Um, and today I'm going to talk about Spice, and specifically about smart streaming. Uh, so who among you is using Spice regularly? Okay, so that's a fair number. Uh, who knows about streaming in Spice? So um, nominally, the talk is about smart streaming, which is basically how to optimize uh, the quality of streaming uh, to adjust for adverse conditions. But uh, you're in the right room because you get three talks in one, three layers of talk. Uh, there's a meta talk, which is that instrumentation matters. And there is a meta meta talk, which is that your work is not done until you can actually demo it. So let me first give you uh, an overview of Spice and how it evolved over time. So it's a way to remote access virtual machines and it's portable on, uh, with clients on Linux, Windows, and to some extent Mac OS. Um, it has many components. There is a protocol, a server, client, um, agent. There is a driver in the guest called QXL, etc. And it's the, in the middle of a rather painful transition to uh, whole screen streaming. So why? Because it was initially designed for 2D commons. So it was designed for the time where this was considered at state-of-the-art advanced graphics. And uh, at some point, uh, code was added to detect streaming on part of the screen, like for instance when you watch a YouTube video. Uh, but we are now at the stage where we want to have hardware accelerated full screen uh, video streaming for uh, real 3D content. And then we run into a problem, which is that hardware acceleration today is mostly using H.264, which is full of patents, and patents are evil. I show you here a Google patent for um, get, uh, toys with that, that basically spy on you with cameras and stuff in it. So streaming, um, the problem is that it's more sensitive to the environment, like the network quality or things like that. So you play and you end up with something that looks a little bit like this. So the gaming experience is not, it's not right. It skips from time to time and so on. Smart streaming is, tries to address that to smooth things up and uh, basically degrade, for instance, the picture quality to make sure that you stay at high FPS. So what is the traditional Spice uh, drawing model? So you have the Spice client on the left and then the network transmitting the Spice protocol. And on the right, you have QMU and the Spice server is inside QMU and then you have your guest and you have components inside the guest that store data. So now you have some sort of modern operating system from the 1980s in it that does you know, its typical stuff, draws on the screen, and so what happens is it, it basically talks to QXL and sends things down and then they are sent over the network and that allows the Spice client on the other side to reconstruct based on what it receives. And it can receive different types of objects depending on what you're drawing. Now, when you use this same model uh, for 3D content, what happens is that you basically get a big fat big ma uh, uh, bitmap, sorry, not Big Mac. <laughs> 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 and, then, and then basically your gaming experience on the other side is like this, right? So this is not great. So that's where streaming comes in and basically turns your content into video on the fly and the problem is when the network is bad, you end up with demo with video that is slower, grainier, and, and has a higher delay. So you can see that the video on the left is way behind the video on the right. So of course, if you're playing a game, which it's all designed for a game. I, I hope you understood that. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so, um, so what are the issues and bottlenecks with streaming? Can you name some of them? You have an idea. That's an interactive part of, of this talk. So network bandwidth. OK, so we have this. What else? Latency. What else? Packet loss. Packet loss. Yeah, yeah. Let's put that in, in the network. In the, I did not have enough room in, the, in there for. So but outside of the network, what else can go wrong? So CPU. Which CPU? Both. Both. OK, so we have client CPU. It may overload, and we have the host CPU. What else? The GPU. Where? 
both sides too, but I did not have enough room on the left. So, I th so actually, the GPU, there are two components in it that we use. There is the drawing part, and there is the st streaming encoding part. So they, they can both overload. So let's try to see what we can do. So the first thing was to identify the problem in an easy to understand way. So I had to create some tools to be able to identify these problems, and that was the topic of another talk I gave on Friday. So basically, sorry, too late. <laughs> you can watch it on YouTube later. Some of you were actually there, so thank you for attending both talks. But summary there is that it's basically a tool that records data in real time and allows you to graph it and also has some interactive parts. So the other talk was about how Spice forced me to add all these extra features that don't seem to belong to logging, but actually did because I needed them. So go watch the other talk. It's very interesting. Sure. So, <laughs> um, so from then the other thing is uh, I knew I needed to, to have some sort of um, um, feedback mechanism to send data collected from the Spice client. And there's a variety of things I want to collect. And I don't know ahead of time. So basically, um, I added some um, tagged data mechanism that can measure things at various stages and various times in the client and send them to the, to the, the QMU and Spice server. And then the Spice server has some magic in there and thinks about all this data and sends adjustment comments to the streaming agent. And same thing, the adjustment comments may not arrive all at the same time. So, so it's also a tagged mechanism for that. And then um, there was a need to add some smart in the server. So I wanted this to be conf configurable for experimentation purpose because I did not know what I was doing at all. So basically, I better uh, adjust it to try to find a good way. But I thought initially of a, a smart technique that was basically try to say, if you can only display at 20 FPS, then configure the host to uh, send 20 FPS. So that's a follow algorithm. It's ex extremely dumb. And um, uh, that was what I wanted to start with. And then I thought, oh, I have this idea of if the FPS is like this and this, then it means the network is broken. At that. So that was the smart algorithm. It's about th three times as long. Uh, it tries to guess where the bottleneck is, and uh, in practice, it was a fat failure because the, the dumb algorithm turns out to be doing exactly as well. So let's see in practice um, what, the, what it means to work on this. So let me actually restart this uh, um, and explain what, what's going on. So we do have on, on the right, ah, they gave us of course, they gave us a resolution for the screen, and it's not what I have. <laughs> so, sorry, the text is outside. The um, text at the top and the bottom is slightly outside. Let me fix that, because it's going to be annoying. So now you know, you know it's how it's done inside. Ah, that's the layout. I don't know. Ah, better. Now you can read the text of the top. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for the interruption of the programming. So, um, so this is uh, the typical setup since you have client, server, and agent on the right. So you have these three columns. On the left, it's a client. And then you see how I can start the various instrumentation. So you will see this sort of repeat. It's just so that you understand the layout of the screen. It's a relatively complicated test setup. And then basically, once you have started the agent, then you get your 3D graphics, and, uh, and you can measure things. And then you can start the client side instrumentation start the server-side instrumentation. So you sort of get the idea of having these columns on the screen to try to understand what's happening. Does that make sense? Uh, it's a bit confusing, but you'll probably understand better with this first example, which is how to accelerate the client. That's the ideal case. So you have what is measured by the client on the left, the server frames and bytes per second, and then you have this workload that I will be adjusting to see how the system behaves. And then you have the agent parameters at the bottom, and it's not active yet because there is no smart streaming. 
So if I start a GPU-intensive workload, then the GPU gets overloaded, and you can see that the FPS on the left goes down. So the bytes per second gets higher because it's complex content, and the frames per second gets low because the GPU can't cope. Okay, so um, now I activate smart streaming on this kind of content. So there I'm activating the dump algorithm. Uh, equals one is dump, equals two is smart. And um, <laughs> uh, parsing is not. So then basically uh, it, it activates and it applies the parameters. So what you had on the left was the server and then on the right is the um, uh, agent. And then when I change the, the workload, you can see the effect on the left. So it's going to show up um, in, in the leftmost columns. So then what I have is a very simple content that displays at 60 FPS easily. And you can see that on the left, the client FPS goes up. The bandwidth goes down because the content is extremely simple. And so the server follows. Remember, the algorithm is simple. So it, it just follows that and sends that to the agent. And the agent configures the encoder. And everything is fine so far. Does that make sense so far? Please interrupt if there is any question. So in order to tune all this, uh, there are a number of tweaks. So there are at least with help, it's self-documented. And the server logs shows me the kind of things I can adjust. So I'm going to adjust the one that is called target weight. It's, it's a weighted average of various things. And so I'm going to make it so that it reacts faster. So I set this in real time. What the other talk was explaining is that the reason for doing this, for having this kind of, of tweaks, is that so, so that I don't have to restart the VM just because I want to change some parameters. So basically, the VM, the server are still running, and I send that live, and this allows me to uh, see how the system evolves based on these changes. So I adjust this parameter, and, um, and I'm going to see that now the slope, when I do this uh, workload change, the slope on the left is faster. Now, I gave a higher weight to this target, so now I see that basically it's, uh, it's climbing faster. So that's how I can sort of tweak to try to have something that behaves more or less the way I want. So let's observe some reactions. Um, it's now adjusted for faster re reaction. I'm going to try various workloads, and I can see on the left that it follows and adjusts. Um, so on the left, again, it's what the client measures. So you see the results, which are here dominated by the GPU not being able to do. But you see the agent is responding faster than before. The slope is slightly bigger than it used to be. Now, let's try to have a network degradation. So it's a demanding workload here, which is both fast and changes all the screen. So it uses a lot of bandwidth and requires high FPS. That's a real test. And what we see there is that basically now the network is limiting, so the client skips. It's, that's what I showed earlier, except there it's a real workload, and you see it in real time. So that's not really usable. And what happens also is that in that case, the network accumulates some frames. So when you lift that, you see this spike on the left, which is basically the network catching up and sending extra frames. So you see it displays very fast. But then when you restore, you do the opposite, the client freezes. So it's basically, you, you can end up, uh, if you have too much network blocking, um, then you can end up with, for instance, um, sorry, let me, uh, uh, you, you can see on the right, uh, let me replay this one. You see on the right that when I restore the network con constraint, um, what happens is that the, um, uh, the whole network stack gets clogged, and it actually freezes, and it actually blocks the encoder. So I'm at the point where I can't even generate frames. So the playback is really random at that stage. It's not really useful. So let's activate smart streaming and see what happens when we have that. Same conditions. So now you see on the right that the uh, BPS, so bytes per second and frames per second, are now guided by the smart streaming algorithm. And uh, the client does report a drop in bytes per second because of the network and a drop in frames per second because it's guided to do so. And then the algorithm figures out that it needs to decrease bandwidth first. And so what you see is that now the picture quality degrades, but the encoder is not blocked. So you have something where the picture quality goes, low, goes down, but you still have FPS and the encoder is, is not blocked. Now if I switch to something that is very fast and very simple, then we measure higher FPS, lower 
bandwidth, and the adjustment uh, occurs on the right as well. So you end up with now setting high FPS and low bandwidth, which is exactly what we want. So you can see the encoder generates practically no data. So if we have a content that is both fast and complex, then you'll see that the, there is a requirement for higher bandwidth on the left, and, um, and then both adjust on the right in the same way. So now the encoder ends up being network limited, and the reason it's network limited is because at some point on the left, the bias per second reaches the plateau, so it no longer increases, and that's, that's why it stops. That's why the system stops. So it basically uses as much bandwidth it can, as it can. Okay, let me give you another example. Oh, sorry, no. First, return to nominal. So just observe. So uh, observe the one on the right here, on the top right, which is over X11. So you can see how X11 fares relative to smart, Spy Smart Streaming. And you can see that it was skipping, where Smart Streaming, well, the, the Spice content was relatively smooth. So now if I lift network conditions, then everything goes back up because I have more bandwidth until I don't need more. It basically says, oh, at that stage, I can encode my image as well as I, I want, and that's why it stops. So let me degrade the network very badly now. So I'm, it's basically half the bandwidth I had before. X11 doesn't work anymore. It's, it skips. It's completely slow. But then Spice sits smooth because we are basically within a relatively good uh, bandwidth uh, capability. And we, but what happens is you can see here that the picture quality goes down. So it's still smooth, but the picture quality gets more blocky. And you can see that the adjustment became very sharp as soon as the content required more data. So it, it really adjusts depending on the actual content. Now, another case, um, and that's on macOS, where we have a very simple content. Despite that, the macOS client can't keep up. It can display. So look on the left. It's, it's really the display that is uh, delayed because it happens to be a software display at the moment. It doesn't use any hardware acceleration. And so we have this discrepancy. And if you look down, it's not a bandwidth problem at all. It's not a network issue. But what happens is that we have undisplayed frames that pilot. Since then, Frediano has fixed that specific problem. But it was to show the average uh, decoding queue then it sort of piles up. And, and, um, and we need a, to find a way to address that. So this is without smart streaming. So the problem with this queue is that it causes unbound latency. So you can end up with what is being displayed by your client being five seconds or 10 seconds or two minutes behind what uh, is actually sent by the server. So let's activate smart streaming, same method as before. And you see that we have this display adjustment in the agent. Um, and, uh, and so the receive size now goes down quite a bit. The queue length starts going down as well. And so the queue backlog starts evaporating slowly. So in about one minute, you completely recover of this big backlog you had to the point where the problem is solved, and you are basically now displaying frames in real time again. So now it's a completely different problem from the previous one, but we solve it the same way. And then the, the number of FPS stays re reduced. So, so basically, it stays sync, in sync with the server. So now the server tries to push the FPS a bit up from time to time. You see that it's trying to um, get back up. But whenever it does that, the queue length starts increasing again. And so there is this queue buildup, which would create latency. So basically, it shoots shut it down again. So you stay with relative low F, relatively low FPS, which is exactly what you need in this condition. Not like before, where we could adjust the bandwidth. Here, it's not the bandwidth problem. It's just FPS. So we lower the FPS to deal with a CPU overload on the client side. So what we have seen so far is basically that we have a mechanism to send metrics, take action, and control parameters. So it's tagged metrics, because just like on these little tags here, uh, we never run out of ideas of about what to, to send. So I, let, let me, I love this one. <laughs> <laughs> mm. 
remove child. <laughs> okay, so, oops, sorry. Uh, so currently, uh, the implementation basically records frames per second and bytes per second for four categories, which are received, decode, displayed, and dropped. And I'm out of time. Uh, it also monitors Q depth, Q length, because this was the Q length case was the perfect storm when everything was wrong on the client. Uh, but this can be updated without breaking the protocol because there is a rule, which is if you send a tag you don't recognize, you just ignore it. So talking to me, I'm not listening, and it should still work. I used this instrumentation because qualitative picture evaluation was way too difficult. It's like the game of seven differences between the top and bottom. You can't compare. If you don't adjust things to see what happens, you can't really compare by just watching at the screen and trying to remember how it was before. I used the recorder library to have quantitative results from which I derived qualitative results. I'll let you read this little thing here. Uh, quantitative is not what you want to have in the end. You want to have a qualitative result out of these numbers. So did everybody read that? And I used the recorder tweaks to adjust behavior in real time. So basically, the tweak name comes from this kind of things, real time tuning. And I think it's a convincing way to be sure that it, it's actually well. So that back to the meta discussion, that's a good way to convince yourself that what you're doing is actually working. In this case, in a rather complicated environment with three, you know, server, three components that interact. Now, it's not finished. We're still working on it. So right now, it looks more, a little like this, right? Fred, I know. <coughs> That's a fair statement. <laughs> but it's, it's promising. And with that, I'm done. Sorry, I was one minute late. Any questions? We have only four minutes left for questions. No questions? Seriously? Yes? Is it already upstream? Is it already upstream? That's part of, so I was wondering what part of this, uh, of this picture was not completely clear. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not, in, it's upstream in the sense it's published, there is a branch that you can build, etc. but it's not in master. And it's not in master because there are tons of things um, that are completely independent pieces, like the instrumentation is the independent from, so, uh, so it's, it's complicated. It impacts all the components in SPICE at the same time. So uh, as a result, for instance, I also redid the build system to be able to build all components in one build. But I did it in a way that the team went another way. They went uh, the Mason way, uh, used make files. And so, so basically I have my own little incompatible build system uh, that they don't want to adapt, which I perfectly understand. So, so there are a number of things that still remain to be integrated. So there's, there's no, no reasonable how to. Uh, if you want to see it in your own system, why, why you should? It's not, mm -hmm. it's not so, really possible. So I think your question is, uh, can you try this on your own system? Yeah. If you and know you how to build, build, yes. Yeah. It's, 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 Yes, it's, it's relatively. Yes, and when, when I said the, the problem was uh, to make the build easy, so what I added is basically a top level build for Spice, where you go at the top, you do make the, it configures for you, uh, and it goes, it builds all the components, and then you do make install, it installs all the components at once. So it's relatively easy because I needed to update all the components at the same time, so it, it was uh, the reason following so. But then at the same time, we were all, all, the whole team was convinced that the build system needed improvement. They did not trust me for the make file stuff, and so they said, well, Mason is the trusted entity, let's try that. So they went for the Mason side of things, which I think is working now, but, but the result is uh, I'm not doing things like the, other, the rest of the team. So. My bad. Also no configuration. It, some configuration magic. No, uh, so because I hate autoconf, so I also created a small project called Make It Quick. So that's a plug for another project. So Make It Quick is basically autoconf, so it's auto configuration without autoconf. It's make, make files that are auto configured for you, works on macOS, 
Windows, uh, Linux, and BSD. Yeah, so those, yeah. So take it as it is and it should yes, happen. it should work. It's, so uh, the recorder itself is a submodule of that specific branch. And the scope, the, the tool I am using to tweak is a, a very small, pro cute project that is within this submodule. So, so you can actually build everything from one Git pool. Again, I'm too lazy. So Folks being lazy tend to create all these extra projects to do the thing for them. So normally you should just make, make install and be done with it. Actually, you can, you can even test without make install. You can test it in place as well. So you don't have to destroy your system with my stuff to, <laughs> to test it. We are completely out of time, but then there is nobody behind. So if you want to ask more questions, I think you can join me outside and you can discuss that. There is no room after, there is no room after, after Yes, that's what I'm saying. So if you want to ask another question, I, okay, I'm here to answer.